Okay. So uh, for people who don't know Quant University, we are based out of Mass, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, we started Quant University in 2013 to build in the confluence of all the things which are happening in the context of data science, machine learning, and primarily quantitative finance. You know, my, ground, my background has been in financial services and I'd worked at Citigroup, I'd worked at a company called MathWorks, and we had done a lot of uh, quantitative finance projects. And we were seeing this confluence of interest in data science, machine learning, and uh, we basically started an advisory so that we can help customers build in the uh, various uh, experiments with respect to whether machine learning is the right choice for building out machine learning systems. And that uh, consulting and advisory based approach morphed into a university wherein we have been trying to educate people on the various aspects on how do you build machine learning systems? How do you build data science systems? And we also do a lot of research on various topics. And uh, we also do a lot of boot camps and uh, this summer, we are hosting our first online Quant University Summer School. And uh, as some of you who are coming back to the summer school know that we have, in the past four weeks, we have had various speakers from various uh, domains, some of them practitioners, some of them academics, present their research and present their uh, experiments and present their uh, areas of work, uh, basically in the intersection of how uh, finance and machine learning and various aspects of innovations which are happening in the industry. So uh, if you are interested in knowing more about the Quant University Summer School, please go to qsummerschool.splashthat.com and it's also on the webpage of uh, Q Academy. You should be able to find it. And um, next week, we're gonna have uh, Tony Guaida, who is based out of Switzerland. And uh, he's gonna be sharing some of his uh, research on machine learning for factor investing. Tony has written a book recently on uh, machine learning for factor investing, and he's writing the Python version of the book. And he also teaches at a couple of uh, universities and other entities, and he's gonna be presenting some of this research. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Julia Fanti. Um, so the, the reason why uh, synthetic data generation is very interesting for me is primarily one, you know, as an academic, I also teach at Northeastern University. I've been doing some research in the context of what synthetic data generation means, but we have also been looking at the various um, approaches on generation of synthetic data, especially in the financial services world when you have to factor in various aspects of, you know, what happens if certain scenarios were never, you know, presented to a machine learning algorithm and how does the machine learning algorithm behave? And when you do stress testing and scenario testing, you know, what kinds of scenarios can you present to your various algorithms? And also trying to understand the robustness of the algorithm. How do you generate scenarios which would be helpful to kind of accomplish what we are trying to do, either model validation or for evaluation of potential economic scenarios or other kinds of scenarios in the financial services setting. So there have been multiple approaches in synthetic data generation. And I was kind of fascinated by this whole new area of deep neural networks and application of GANs for generating synthetic data generation, uh, for synthetic data generation. And I came across uh, this wonderful work called Doppelganger by uh, Julia and her team, uh, based out of uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And I invited her to present her work and that's gonna be the presentation Julia is gonna be uh, doing for us. And uh, for people who don't know Julia, so Julia, uh, is uh, an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon University, and she primarily focuses on algorithmic foundations of blockchain, which is also another interesting topic for me, distributed systems, privacy preserving technologies, machine learning, et cetera. And uh, amongst various uh, you know, other roles she has had at uh, ACM, NC, NSF, and uh, World Economic Forum, uh, she's also a recent recipient of the Faculty Research Award uh, from JP Morgan Chase for generating synthetic time series data sets. And uh, she has a PhD from uh, UC Berkeley and also a bachelor's from the Allen College of Engineering. And uh, I just want to give an anecdote there. I'm based out of Wellesley in Boston and Allen is like a mile away from here. So five or six years ago, probably, uh, Julia was kind of uh, you know, a student in the area. And uh, you know, I teach at Babson College too. So it was kind of probably we have seen each other in maybe a, a grocery store or a, a campus somewhere. Uh, but it was kind of interesting that, um, you know, she had uh, studied close by uh, where I currently live. 
Um, so without further ado, I uh, would uh, hand over the, uh, the stage to Julia, the virtual stage to Julia. Julia, please take over. Uh, thank you so, so much, Sri, for the nice introduction. Um, so, so what me... I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to make you the first and um, you should be able to share your screen. Yes, we can see your screen if you can. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for joining. It's really exciting to be here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about some recent work that my collaborators and I did on generating synthetic time series data uh, using GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. So this was joint work with uh, two of my students, Zinan Lin and Alankar Jain, uh, a collaborator at IBM, Chen Wang, and uh, Bias Sekar, who is uh, Zinan's co-advisor. And I, I want to mention before I start that we, uh, I think she mentioned this, but we're in a um, electrical and computer engineering department. So our focus has been a little bit different from what you might be interested in in the finance world. But a lot of the tools, as we'll see, have kind of similar aims and can be evaluated on similar types of tasks. So for us, a, a key stumbling block is really access to data. And there's two, there's multiple different ways in which access to data can cause problems. One is in the enterprise setting. Uh, different enterprises may have access to proprietary data that they would like to be able to share uh, in order to improve business outcomes, to develop new products, for example. Or in our case, we've been really interested in trying to detect emerging cybersecurity threats. Uh, and this lack of data sharing means that collaborative opportunities tend to go untapped. But even within the same enterprise, often it can be the case that different divisions are not allowed to share data because of privacy policies. So for example, uh, Gmail data uh, cannot be used by Google Maps. So this once again makes it more difficult to develop better products and to evaluate uh, and make full use of data. And then here on the outskirts, we have the, another party of sad researchers who don't have access to any data at all. And this has caused problems in terms of unreproducible research, and it really limits the potential of data-driven research to those researchers who have access and have connections to large enterprises. So today we have this siloed situation where nobody's really sharing data. And the idea that we are trying to pursue in our group is, is sharing synthetic data models. So the idea here is that everyone who has relevant data can train a generative model on their data and share those generative models with potentially a centralized data clearinghouse, or you could imagine pairwise sharing agreements, uh, which enables everybody to uh, make use of, of other parties' data. Now, if we want to envision this kind of pipeline or even variants of this pipeline, there's two key stumbling blocks. There's two properties that we really need to be able to satisfy. The first of these is fidelity. So if our real data satisfies a certain distribution, our generated data should also satisfy the same distribution or a close distribution according to some metric. The second key concern is privacy, which is really the, the motivating factor for this entire problem. And in, the, in terms of privacy, there's really two types of privacy that enterprises tend to care about. The first is business secrets. So they don't want to reveal data that could leak sensitive information about like, their projected returns for the next quarter or you know, some business capabilities that they're trying to keep secret. And the other type of privacy concern that often arises is protecting user data. And this can be both an inherent desire to protect your user's data, but it's often also governed by legal requirements um, against leaking or sharing data that has been collected for a certain purpose. So the two key challenges to enabling this vision of, of data sharing is to design generative models that have both good fidelity properties and good privacy properties with respect to these two types of privacy concerns that I mentioned. 
So how do existing methods fare? Um, well, I'm gonna talk here at a very high level about um, existing work. But in general, if we look at existing approaches, uh, one of the approaches that was most widely used until like maybe a decade ago, um, well, it's still used, but in the academic community, it kind of fell out of favor about a decade ago, is to share anonymized raw data. So the idea here is that you'll do some kind of redaction on your data set and um, hope that that redaction of uh, PII is sufficient. So this tends to have very good fidelity, uh, but as we've seen over the course of numerous attacks in recent years, this tends to have pretty bad privacy. So an adversary with some side information can often figure out whose data they're looking at, even if the PII has been redacted. So one of the high profile instances of this was the Netflix data set that was released a, a while ago. At the other, other end of the spectrum, we have general purpose parametric models. Uh, so these are things like autoregressive models that have been studied for decades. And the idea there is that you specify some parametric model for how your data is being generated. And then you try to tr train the parameters of that model accordingly. And classical such models tend to have very good privacy in part because they have really poor fidelity. They're not really capturing the important structural properties of the data. So it's difficult for them to leak anything sensitive about the underlying data. And then maybe somewhere in between, we have expert driven parametric models. Um, so we see, uh, I'm less familiar with the finance literature, but in the engineering and networking literature, we've seen lots of examples of um, researchers designing parametric models where they know, for example, that two hosts, uh, like uh, two servers are gonna communicate using a certain protocol and that protocol has certain properties and so based on those properties, they design parametric models that really use domain knowledge to uh, figure out what the data that they're trying to generate should look like. So these tend to have better fidelity, but the key problem is that it's difficult to, for these models to capture properties that were not initially designed by, by the experts. Um, so in general, it's difficult for these parametric models to really capture high dimensional correlations uh, that we don't necessarily have a priori information of. Okay, and then the final category of models, uh, which is what I'm going to be talking about today is machine learned models. And these are um, becoming more popular. And in particular, with the rise of deep learning, people have been looking a lot at trying to um, learn neural networks that are doubling as generative models for synthetic data. And here I've drawn an oval associated with this category of models because there's really a wide swath of fidelity and privacy uh, operating points depending on how you instantiate this model. Uh, so we're going to talk about our adventures in trying to design good machine learned generative models that have both good privacy and fidelity. So in this talk, I'll talk about Doppelganger, which is a uh, GAN-based generative model for generating time series synthetic data. So we navigate both of these two requirements, fidelity and privacy, uh, with a focus really on fidelity. So we're gonna talk about how we got doppelganger or how we tried to address challenges in modeling complex correlations, both in time and across uh, multiple dimensions of your data and dealing with challenges that arise frequently in networking and systems data, like a high dynamic range of values. And these are properties that I think arise also in, um, in financial data. I'll talk about this more later. And on the privacy side, I'm gonna talk about uh, some preliminary results on showing how Doppelganger can protect user data and trade secrets. Um, and also really, I think the, the main point of the privacy section of this talk is to highlight challenges because I think this is actually far from solved problem. Okay, so to start out with, I wanted to give a very brief primer on GANs. Um, so, uh, many of you may have heard of these already, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. GANs are a type of neural network 
uh, generative model. So the idea is they are given a training data set. So in this example, our training data is facial images. And what we want to do is to train a neural network generator, which I call here G, that takes as input some noise vector and outputs a sample from the same distribution as my original training data. So ideally, we would like this generator to be able to output a picture, a realistic looking picture of a face. So how do we do this? Uh, well, the way this is done is by introducing a second neural network called the discriminator. And the goal of the discriminator is to take as input an image, either real, so from the training data, or generated by the generator. And it has to tell if the image that it's seeing is real or fake. So in this case, the discriminator is receiving the picture of the dog, and so it should output that the image is fake. Whereas if it got the image from the training data set, it should output that the image is real. Now, the, the way that GANs work is to train the generator and discriminator adversarially, meaning we train them in alternation. So the discriminator is trying to get as good as possible at telling between fake and real images, while the generator is trying to produce images that are able to fool the discriminator. So they're competing with each other. Okay. And prior work has shown that if you train GANs with enough training data and enough capacity in your neural network models, um, the GAN objective converges to uh, produce samples from the underlying data distribution. Okay, so under some um, assumptions, some strong assumptions, this converges to the, uh, to the desired function. Okay. So, um, why are we looking at GANs here? GANs have been tremendously successful in the image and video domain. And the reason they've been so successful is partially because prior approaches to generating uh, images have been likelihood based. So they assume some prior generative model, uh, parametric generative model, and they try to learn those parameters by maximizing the likelihood of the generated images. In contrast, GANs don't have to make this assumption and instead use adversarial learning. So this is, so people sometimes call this likelihood free uh, learning. And this allows us to limit our a priori assumptions. So I want to highlight that GANs are still parametric in the sense that our uh, generator and our discriminator do have parameters, their neural networks that we're training. But the um, the assumptions that we have to make on how those param parameters control the output are more limited than in prior work. And so this has uh, contributed to GAN's ability to generate some really remarkable uh, photorealistic images. So they're currently state of the art in generative models for, for the image domain. Now, in general, uh, in the networking security systems domain, as well as uh, I believe finance domain, we're often not interested in images, but we're interested in time series data. So that was the focus for our work. So we were interested in time series data that can have multiple dimensions and can also be associated with some metadata. Okay, so for example, if we are trying to generate a time series of stock prices for US tech stocks, uh, our metadata could be labels specifying that, you know, the company is based in the US and the category of the stock is, a, is tech. And our time series data could be multiple uh, concurrent prices for different stocks. Okay, so this is the type of data that we're really targeting in this work. And um, because of our focus in, in uh, engineering context, we were looking at data sets that are relevant to networking security and systems. So we looked at two main types of data sets. One is cluster traces. So we looked at performance traces from compute clusters from Google and IBM. So these would be things like measuring the amount of CPU usage for a machine over time. Um, and the other type of data that we looked at were traffic measurements. So we looked at um, daily page views for Wikipedia articles 
So this was our Wikipedia web traffic data set. And another data set we looked at was measuring internet usage from devices around the United States. So this is called the FCC Measuring Broadband America project. So they released an open source data set with measurements from this project. Okay, so this is the type of data that we're interested in. Now, how do we go about trying to model it? So to start out, I want to present to you a naive design that, that you could imagine using, and uh, I'll show you why it doesn't work. So a naive design that we could think of is to replace our training data set with time series. Okay, so here each sample, so here uh, we have four samples. Uh, each one is a collection of, of time series. And we have our generator directly output uh, a time series. So notice that because our uh, our generator is a neural network of fixed dimensionality. The output also has to be a time series of fixed dimensionality. And we can train this GAN as we would normally, or we can use improved losses like Wasserstein loss. Now, this, this naive approach has two main problems. The first one is that our signal length is fixed, uh, but that's kind of a second order effect. This is something that we can fix. But the bigger problem is that this architecture doesn't learn correlations well. So as the dimensionality of your time series grows, this kind of architecture gets worse and worse at uh, capturing the correlations between different points in time. Okay. So the, the entire uh, point of Doppelganger was really to try to um, learn better correlations and uh, by, by modifying this, this naive design. Okay. So the, I'm gonna talk about three main concepts that we used for the design of Doppelganger. So the first one is addressing this point that I mentioned earlier that the dimensionality of our outputs was fixed. So in reality, we want to be able to generate outputs of different lengths. And so to address this, we replaced our generator with a recurrent neural network or an RNN. And this allows us to generate data on each pass through the RNN so we can make sequences that are as long as we want. The second point that we introduced here is that the RNN, instead of outputting a single sample at a time, it's going to output batched samples. So in this, in this picture here, we can see that the RNN is outputting three samples at a time instead of one sample at a time. And the reason that we did this batched output is because it helped to uh, capture temporal correlations. If you don't do that, your generator quickly loses track of the, um, the data that it output you know, a while ago. And it makes it difficult for these generators to produce time series that are longer than a few tens of samples, which is obviously going to be a problem if we're trying to generate months or years worth of data. So, um, so step one is to use an RNN generator with batched output generation. The second challenge that we went into is that we were really training on data sets with a high dynamic range across time series. So what I mean by that is in the time series that we were looking at, some time series would have min and max values that were pretty small whereas other time series could have min and max values that were much larger. Okay, so uh, there's a high dynamic range across, across time series, not just within the same time series. And what we found is that when you train GANs on these kinds of signals with a high, uh, with a high dynamic range, you often end up getting mode collapsed outputs. So mode collapse is a phenomenon that happens a lot in GANs, where even if you train your data, train your GAN on a very diverse data set, it learns to produce samples that all look almost identical. So like here, um, what I'm plotting is example time series. Um, so from, from the Wikipedia web traffic data set. Okay. So the web traffic data set looks at the number of page views per Wikipedia article over a little over 500 days. Okay, so our horizontal axis here is the day count 
And uh, the vertical axis is the normalized number of page views per day. And so what we see is that all of the samples that we're generating have almost identical patterns. Okay, so they're a little bit shifted, but otherwise they look very similar. So this is indicative of a mode collapsed GAN. It hasn't learned to produce a diverse enough set of samples. So how do we deal with that? Well, kind of the first thing that you might think about if we're trying to fix this issue of high dynamic range is normalization. Okay. And in fact, we ended up proposing a uh, type of normalization to deal with this effect. However, the way that we typically normalize signals is to normalize by the global min and max. So if our data set has these three signals in it, we would find the global max across all three signals and the global min across all three signals and normalize them so that the max corresponds to plus one and the min corresponds to minus one, for example. The problem with this is that it doesn't really solve anything because the reason we're getting this mode collapse is because the scale of some time series is so much smaller than the scale of others. So normalizing by constant doesn't solve that problem at all. So what we ended up doing is to normalize each time series individually and store the min and max per time series as a type of metadata. So let me show you an example. So for the black curve, we would find the min and max for the black curve and store those numbers as a separate attribute and generate the time series so that it's uh, ranging between plus one and minus one. Now we do the exact same thing for the red curve. We find its min and max, uh, store them separately and generate the, the time series as if it's between minus one and plus one and so forth. Okay. So then at, at the end, after you've generated these time series, you can use these separate metadata uh, pairs to renormalize your signal to the correct range. And we found that this was much more effective uh, and improved the mode collapse problem. So on the bottom here, you can see the normalized page views uh, as a function of day. And what we see is that now our samples, our time series are much more diverse than they were before. So we have much, uh, we have much less mode collapse than we previously did. Okay. The third challenge that we dealt with was um, complex relationships and correlations in, in our metadata. So basically we needed to capture the relation between our metadata and our time series measurements. So for example, in our uh, FCC measurement database, uh, we had some users who were cable users and others who were mobile users. And those two are gonna have very different internet access patterns. Um, and, you need, and your generator needs to be able to capture these correlations. Um, so in the finance setting, these might be like different types of, of stocks. You want to be able to capture the, the different patterns in different categories of, of stock prices. So one simple straw man solution is to have your generator output both metadata and your time series jointly. And what we found is that this is too difficult for a single generator. <coughs> Excuse me. So what I'm showing you here is a histogram of the min, uh, you can think of this as a, a min plus max over two, um, which recall from the previous slide, we're treating the min and the max as metadata now. Okay, so this is one of our, our metadata attributes and it's related to the time series itself. And what we see is that in the real data, this max plus min over two has a certain his histogram and doppelganger is learning a histogram that really doesn't do very well, especially at the tails. Okay. So, and, and this is using a, a single generator. So really the single generator was not doing a good job of learning the distribution of our metadata and the time series. So the way that we dealt with this was by decoupling our generation into multiple parts and introducing an auxiliary disc discriminator. So the idea is that our architecture has one generator that's generating our metadata, one generator that's generating our time series, 
and our discriminator is going to, and we're going to have multiple discriminators, one that's only evaluating metadata and one that's evaluating both metadata and time series together. Okay, so to show you um, the effect of this, by adding this auxiliary discriminator, we're able to much more faithfully capture the distribution of max plus min over two. And we found that this was more generally true for other attributes as well. Okay, so to summarize the design here, we had a few components. The first part was that our generator is using a recurrent neural network, an RNN, to output batched samples. The second part is that we have a separate metadata generator um, that is uh, producing our metadata separately from the time series and feeding that generated met metadata into the RNN. And we have a discriminator that's jointly discriminating over the metadata and the time series. And we actually have a separate metadata, metadata generator for the min max values. So we treat that as a separate component. And finally, we have this auxiliary discriminator, which is only evaluating the generated metadata. Okay. Uh, so that's the, the full design of Doppelganger. So there was a question, um, Sri, how, how do I do this? Um, um, I'm not seeing any questions in the panel. I think I saw some someone. I uh, saw so a pop up that someone raised their hand. Okay, maybe it just popped on Yar and Julia. I don't see any questions in here. Uh, yeah, Hugh Crowther raised hand. Um, yeah. uh, so would you mind, uh, so the people in the audience, would you mind typing your questions in the chat window, please, so that we can get to the questions when we do the fire chat afterwards? Fire side chat afterwards. Okay, so I'll, I'll address questions at the end then? Yeah, that I think that'll be good. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so, um, all right, so next I'll talk about evaluating the fidelity of doppelganger. And I want to touch on some common approaches and some pitfalls that I've seen while evaluating papers in this space, things to look out for. So evaluating GANs and generative models in general is really difficult because as I mentioned earlier, it's a likelihood free approach, which means that it's difficult to evaluate how good your generated samples are. We can't easily compute a, a likelihood from the generated samples. So because of this, people have resorted primarily to two types of evaluation. One is uh, just evaluating the quality of the samples uh, visually, qualitatively. And the other is evaluating samples on downstream tasks. So. Um, the pitfalls that I'm listing here are things that I've seen primarily in the context of evaluating time series GANs. So one, one thing that I see kind of often is uh, no comparison to other approaches. So I've seen a number of papers that uh, propose an approach and um, evaluate its fidelity, but without comparing to any other time series GANs. So at this point, there's been quite a, a bit of work on time series GANs. Uh, and time series generative models in general. So it's a little bit difficult to evaluate and compare different approaches without seeing experiments that are kind of comparing apples to apples. Another, a little bit more subtle um, challenge or pitfall that I've seen is only evaluating time series GANs on downstream metrics, such as downstream predictive tasks. So like you use your synthetic data to train a predictor and you evaluate how accurate is that predictor on real data. Um, so this is a perfectly fine evaluation approach, but what can happen is that it can actually mask um, qualitative problems in your data. Uh, and I'll show an example of that later. And a third pitfall that I see um, pretty often is not evaluating memorization of training data. So a big challenge with GANs is that if you train them on data sets that are too small or too uh, uniform, so there's not enough variety in the data set, they can actually start memorizing your training data. And this is, um, this is, of course, a problem from a privacy perspective, but it can also be a problem from a fidelity perspective because you're not really uh, capturing the richness of the model and you're not exploiting it. 
So um, for our experiments, we looked at a few evaluation techniques. The first one is to compute micro benchmarks. So this is trying to um, avoid the problem of only evaluating on downstream tasks. So here we compared learned distributions or statistics with the statistics of real data. So these kinds of comparisons tend to be qualitative, um, which is perhaps why they're not always done. But in many cases, they can highlight serious problems in, in a generative model. So I think they're actually quite important in practice. Then we evaluated some downstream tasks. So we trained predictive models. And we also um, did some basic evaluation of data memorization. And I'll also mention other approaches as well. So our first micro benchmark that we looked at was trying to understand um, various properties of the generated data. And these properties were derived from some domain knowledge. So in this case, we're looking at a histogram of, uh, from the Google cluster data set. And we were trying to understand what's the distribution of the duration of a job in, in the cluster. Okay, so each job can take a different amount of time and we want to ensure that our generator is producing time series that match the distribution of the real data. So here the real data is shown in blue and the generated data is shown in uh, orange or peach, whatever that is. And I'm comparing here on top to doppelganger and on the bottom I'm comparing to an RNN, which was the best baseline that we, that we evaluated against. And what we saw uh, was that the RNN really wasn't able to capture the second peak around 10 seconds. And it completely was not able to capture the tail of this distribution. So capturing tails in general is difficult and GANs are not necessarily great at it either. But we found that GANs tended to be a little bit better at it than other baselines that, that we looked at. Another uh, micro benchmark that we looked at was trying to understand correlations across features. Okay, so, um, so here we had two correlated time series. And this was from the FCC um, measurement data set. Um, so uh, like traffic, um, traffic counts and uh, bandwidth used. And we wanted to look at the correlation between these two time series. So, um, and, and here we're plotting the CDF of those correlations across all time series, in, uh, across a number of generated time series. And so what we can see is that the, the doppelganger is able to capture this correlation across features much better than any of the baselines we looked at. Um, yeah, and this is again a, a qualitative statement, but we can also measure the distance um, between the real curve and, and the generated curve. Okay, so this, this one is one of my favorite plots. Um, so this is showing for the Wikipedia web traffic data set, the autocorrelation of the generated time series. So basically, uh, let's start by looking at this black curve. So this black curve is the autocorrelation of the real data. And what we see is two important trends. The first trend is the, the high frequency squiggles. So the high frequency squiggles are representing weekly uh, peaks, weekly patterns in, in access to Wikipedia articles. The second important uh, pattern that we see here is around 365. We see another peak in the autocorrelation, meaning that there are also annual patterns. So what we, we want is for our generative models to be able to capture both the high frequency patterns, the weekly uh, correlations, and the long-term correlations, so the annual patterns. And what we observed was that um, Doppelganger was pretty well able to capture both of these. And the baselines that we looked at were really not able to at all. And this is actually a pretty challenging task because the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, um, the data has over 500 points in it which is considered pretty long, which is pretty long for, for a lot of GAN and a lot of deep neural network generative models to produce. And actually the purple curve, time GAN, is current state of the art um, 
in the machine learning literature for generating synthetic uh, time series. So this is an example where looking at a qualitative evaluation can highlight problems that are not immediately apparent from evaluating downstream predictive tasks. Okay, so after looking at benchmarks, we moved on to predicting job failures in a compute cluster. So this was an example of such a, of a downstream task. And here we were trying to predict in the Google cluster if a job was going to fail or if it would complete successfully. Uh, and so here we were training on synthetic data and evaluating on real data. And so the leftmost column here, the, um, the grid is our real data. And we trained various machine learning models to predict this failures, failure status. Okay. And so what we want, so ideally we would like for our generated data to have the same accuracy as the real data. But of course, in practice, it's always going to be lower. So what we saw was that um, for the best, for the highest accuracy um, predictors, MLP namely, um, Doppelganger is able to outperform the competing baselines. It's not always the best baseline. So like, for example, for naive Bayes, we can see that uh, an RNN actually does better. But in this case, actually, even the real, real data is not a very good predictor. So we, we do care a little bit more about, um, about the predictors where even the real data is, is a reasonably good approximation or a reasonably good predictor. OK, so the third type of evaluation that I mentioned is evaluating memorization. And there's a few ways that people do this. Um, for our paper, what we decided to do was to take a generated sample, take a, a number of generated samples, and look at the closest real samples in the training data set, and just visually evaluate, do these look the same or not? Um, another way that people often or have done this in the past is by inserting secrets into the training data set. So for example, uh, people have done this with text where they would insert a sentence that says, my social security number is one, two, three, four, five, you know, something like that. And then at test time, they insert the first half of that sentence of the secret sentence and see if the generator spits out the second half. And if so, that's indicative of memorization. Um, so, that technique, we, we didn't use that technique in our paper, but it's also an interesting one that, that could certainly be used. Uh, and I think the important thing here to is to check for memorization, particularly when you're training on relatively small data sets. Okay, so let's move on to privacy. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's two kinds of privacy that we care about in general. One is protecting business secrets, and the other is user privacy. And so what we found is that um, in terms of user privacy, uh, one attack that people often worry about is called membership inference, which describes the ability of an adversary to guess if a certain user was part of the training data or not. Okay? And so um, the way these experiments are set up is that the random baseline is 50%. So the adversary has a 50% chance of guessing correctly with no information. And so we want to get that membership inference success rate as close to 50% as possible. And so we ran some experiments uh, empirically to try to understand the effect of your training sample size on membership inference attacks. And what we found was that as you grow your training data, um, the probability of membership inference attacks being successful get uh, decays pretty quickly. And this is to be expected because with more data, you have better generalization and with better generalization, you're going to have less memorization. Um, so, the, uh, so this trend is completely expected and people have observed similar things in the literature before, but it's a good um, kind of rule of thumb to, to keep in mind. If you want to have better privacy, you should be training with more data. Uh, 
The other thing that we observed is that differentially private stochastic gradient descent um, kills fidelity in GANs. So there have been a couple of papers that propose using differentially private um, SGD for training GANs. So for those of you who are not familiar, differential privacy is a, a common privacy, statistical privacy metric. And people are using it now to train privacy preserving machine learning models. Okay. And it's been used quite successfully for classifiers, for predictive models. But uh, people have more recently tried applying this technique to GANs. And what we found is that when you train these GANs with differentially private SGD, the fidelity really takes a hit. So um, differential privacy comes with a parameter, epsilon. And typical values of epsilon, like typically we say that an epsilon, a reasonable epsilon is around 1 or, or smaller. So if it's too much higher than 1, then it's viewed as not a very strong privacy guarantee. And what we see is that the purple curves, which is the differentially private training, has a really bad autocorrelation. It doesn't really capture any of the global trends that we would like to capture. So this um, kind of highlights some challenges and, and highlights the need for more research on um, differentially private GANs for, for generating better synthetic time series data sets. Um, so before I wrap up, I want to just mention some other approaches and data types that may be of interest as well. So um, in, in Doppelganger, we really were trying to generate data points raw data points as the output of our generator. But another approach that I've seen is generating sequences of embeddings of time series uh, or transformations of time series. So for example, Corrigan is generating correlation matrices and using an image, uh, image GAN to generate them, DC GAN. Whereas time GAN and another recent paper called the Data Driven Market Simulator for Small Data Environments are generating transformed versions of the time series and then later mapping those transformations back to a time series. Um, so we tried running the second paper, a data-driven market simulator on our, um, on our Wikipedia web traffic to try to get the autocorrelation plot. And I'm showing you that here on the right. And uh, notice that this doesn't seem to capture the long or short term um, temporal effects that I mentioned earlier, the weekly or the annual trends. And that's similar to time GAN, which is the purple curve here on the left. And it, it seems to be that because these embeddings are throwing away some information. And so for whatever reason, at least the, at the parameters that we tried, they, they weren't giving very good autocorrelation results. Another area that people are interested in is categorical data. Um, so here, there's, there was a paper last year in NeurIPS on modeling tabular data with conditional GANs. And here, this task gets pretty difficult as the number of, of columns in your tabular data set grows. Um, so here we can see a correlation uh, between uh, real data, uh, between two, two attributes in our real data, which is the blue dots, or sorry, the red dots, which has a very strong correlation. We can see a linear relation here and our synthetic data, which is really not able to capture those correlations at all. Um, OK, so with that, I'll wrap up. Um, so the take home messages, GANs are promising, but don't work off the shelf. And with Doppelganger, we've tried to automatically capture properties that were previously difficult to model. But we leave some open privacy questions, and it's not clear right now if GANs are going to be able to, to address them in general. With that, thanks for your time. and. Uh, okay take some questions. Thank you so much, uh, Julia. This was an excellent presentation. Um, so I just want to say, you know, Aditi, my daughter, wanted to say hi to you. She was also listening to your talk. I mean, that's kind of the pleasure of working from home during COVID-19. You know, we have like uh, students and daughters and everybody just joined the fun. Uh, <laughs> just wanted to say hi. Hi. <laughs> hi, Aditi. <laughs> Cool. So let's let's kind of go to the Q and A part. Um, and uh, this this was uh, this was an excellent orientation for people who did not know what GANs were. But also, thanks so much for taking the time to kind of you know provide the uh, the landscape of the current research efforts and the differentiators between your work and 
some of the other current work which is out there. Uh, so I'm going to just start out with some of the questions um, uh, which came through the chat window. And uh, for people who are listening, if you have any questions for Julia, please type it in the chat window. That way we can see how many we can answer as we go. I think uh, the first question is, can you give an example uh, wherein a single generator fails versus that of a doppelganger design? I think it's a very specific question. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. <clears throat> I don't know if you can even see the, uh, the window. I'm sorry, I actually, I, I couldn't hear the first part of the question. Where, where so what? Question is, can you give an example of a single generator failure versus that of a doppelganger design? A single generator. Does that mean just like a, a naive and a naive? Yeah. A naive Maybe, uh, I think if you're still listening, if you could clarify, I think that'll be helpful. We'll probably just move to the next question. Um, the next question is: At what point training of GANs stops in terms of discriminators? Like when it reaches fifty percent fake and fifty percent real? I think it's more of a conceptual question. Yeah, good question. Um, so this is actually a this is actually kind of a, a sensitive point. GANs are very unstable. Um, so oftentimes when you train them, the training loss, your objective function that you're trying to optimize doesn't actually necessarily go to zero. Sometimes, so, sometimes the discriminator will not actually reach 50%. The generator will not be able to generate images that are tricking the discriminator with 50% probability. But in general, yeah, that's, that's the kind of threshold that you wanna look for. So once the discriminator is able, the discriminator's loss has converged to something close to zero, and the generator is producing samples that are tricking, that are uh, reliably tricking the discriminator with probability close to 0.5. Okay, cool. Uh, another question, uh, just kind of mix and match some of the questions. Uh, one of them is, what was the dimensionality of the data that was taken into consideration in this particular research? So the dimensionality, um, the, okay. So there's a, a few different dimensions that we need to talk about. One is the length of the time series. So here, these were ranging from a few tens of samples to hundreds of samples. Um, we observed degradation in fidelity if we start looking at more than hundreds of samples. So that that is still, I think, difficult for, for us. And in general, I haven't seen, um, I haven't seen other papers that have been able to deal with very long signals. Mm -hmm. um, the other, uh, like the other dimensions, we were looking at uh, attributes that had, you know, a couple of a couple of pieces of metadata, each of which could take, um, you know, constant number of of options, like ten up to ten options, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually had a follow-up question there. So in terms of um, uh, distributions, especially with the, the length of the attributes, do we expect that the training data or the data you're feeding in has to have a uniform distribution for each one of your you know, uh, attributes? Or how does it work? Especially, I mean, that would generate into a tail, right? So if I have like 50 states worth of data and I have one or two urine territories maybe, and I have only a few points for those urine territories, would that even be considered as a part of uh, generation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you have imbalanced data sets, that's going to affect the quality of, like, yeah, it, to use your example, if you have only a few data points from one of the 50 states, it's not going to generate as good of a model. It's not going to learn as good of a model. Okay. Uh, but it will certainly, it will learn something. And the benefit of doing of training again on everything jointly instead of just training 50 separate GANs is that the uh, the categories with less data are able to learn from the other training data as well. Mm -hmm. okay. So they can get like a coarse idea of what their data should look like from every, everybody else and then use their own data to kind of fine tune the model, if that makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, so another question is, uh, what you mentioned about GANs having problems with memorization for smaller data sets. Mm -hmm. Can you give a sense of what constitutes small in this particular case? Um, so, all right, small tends to be like hundreds, hundreds of samples. Um, so you typically want at least a few thousand samples um, to train a GAN that's not just memorizing. And one thing that I've seen that can mask memorization is if you 
sometimes people will take a relatively small data set, like a sequence, a time series, and they'll split it up into chunks, into overlapping chunks. And so what can happen there is that you actually get a large number of time series, but the time series are very heavily correlated because the chunks are very, are very much overlapping. And so in that way, you might have more than a few thousand samples, but actually the diversity of your data is still very low. And so in that case, you can also sometimes get memorization. Mm -hmm. So it's just something to evaluate, I think. Yeah, I actually had a question about evaluation. I, you know, I really appreciate you kind of, you know, going over sort of the challenges of evaluation and, you know, both the downstream methodology and also uh, some of the other things. And I mean, you know, when I do my research, that that's that's kind of my major problem because it's big data generation, and you know, it's again we don't know. And then many a times when we present the work, it's always the question like, you know, do you just compare with what was the real data and then compare the distributions to the fake data versus uh, kind of wait for usage of these data sets. So do you see any kind of um, current research or something coming up wherein it's use case driven, wherein, you know, based on the use case, for example, if it's just, you know, trying to create, uh, you know, uh, private data sets based on what we have seen in the past, you know, based on the original data set, uh, you would potentially go for some evaluation criteria versus, you know, time series scenarios where you're trying to potentially forecast something in the future or maybe even augment some of the things we already have. They would require different kinds of uh, evaluation metrics, some kind of a hierarchy of potential evaluation metrics uh, based on best practices that we have observed. Um, in general, evaluation evaluating GANs and generative models is is an active research area. So there's been work in the last couple of years highlighting some of the problems, um, proposing new mechanisms or new evaluation metrics. Um, I don't think the, like as far as I've seen, the community has not converged on any single metric. Uh, I have seen in some of the more applied papers, people do use these downstream tasks as a way of evaluating the quality of the GAN. And I think that makes a lot of sense as long as you're also keeping in mind that um, that you do need to do some like qualitative, um, get some qualitative understanding of what the data is, looks like. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, is there any way we could potentially uh, go beyond just GAN? I mean, like, you know, there's a lot of other potential possibilities. Uh, I think I've seen some papers, you know, just kind of looking at traditional statistical methods and you know, bootstrapping and uh, other methods. But then also when we look at machine learning, most of the research I've seen is either because of the novelty or just because we've seen some good results, you know, is the application of GANs for synthetic data generation. Um, are, you, are you kind of, you know, looking at other areas in addition to GANs or other promising types of neural networks slash other machine learning methodologies which could be useful? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, one, one other type of neural network that I think would be interesting to look at is language models, mm -hmm. um, which have been, especially in the last like month, have, have made some impressive mm -hmm. breakthroughs in terms of language modeling. And especially for time for discrete time series, I think that mm -hmm. uh, those language models could be quite um, promising. Um, but yeah, in general, there's no reason, there's no fundamental reason why we should be using GANs here. The reason we went with it was just because they've been able to capture really high dimensional correlations in image data, which made us think they might work also for time series. But yeah, certainly there's, there's space for other approaches as well. Okay, cool. Uh, I think we have probably, uh, I'll probably have one last question. Have you seen any kind of uh, ensemble techniques where, you know, certain networks for certain, maybe for data in the middle, and then this other network is really good for data in the tails and kind of you know, bring them together. And then we have a good distribution of data with multiple types of things. Have you seen anything like that? And I'm sorry, the connection's cutting out a bit. Uh, would you mind repeating the question? Um, can I repeat the question? Did you yes. get the question? Or? Uh, I, I couldn't understand my- Oh, interview. sorry, I'll repeat the question. I think there was a little bit of network jitter. Mm -hmm. um, so have you seen any approaches wherein we are kind of using an ensemble of 
potential generators, wherein some generators are really good with like, you know, the majority class, and then some of them are fine tuned towards some of the minority classes so that you get a good distribution for different kinds of, you know, potential data sets. I have not seen uh, an architecture like that with like, completely distinct models for different um, for different types of data. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Okay. It's an interesting question. Nice. So I think there are a couple more questions. I'm just going to take a snapshot of the chat window, uh, Julia, and I'll send it to you. You know, if, if it makes sense to you know for any questions to be answered, please do share so I can like put it on the web page. Uh, so I think it's 101, so I will kind of, you know, start wrapping up the session. Thank you so much again for making time today afternoon for an excellent presentation. It was very enlightening. And also, um, I had read your paper before, but it was kind of really nice to kind of get the perspective and the thought process which went into the design of the doppelganger. So I really appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what I'm going to do is just um, uh, tell uh, the viewers a couple of things. Um, so I'm just going to... Uh, so for some of the questions which weren't answered, uh, we will try and get back to you. Uh, give me one second. Uh, the presentation will be shared. Uh, the link I've already posted. Um, so I don't know how we can get back to um, the screen share. Just a second. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so this is uh, going to be the the page wherein the slides and the video of today's recording will be available. I just wanted to let you know one thing: um, the page has this link called Try a Demo. So we have basically taken the GitHub repository, which has some of the examples Julia was talking about. And we have put together a simple application to let you guys try out the doppelganger. So there's some brief information about uh, the paper and the work and uh, the setup of the problem and how the data series and the sample application looks. And uh, we can also, there is also a, a Google Colab notebook if you wanted to replicate the research yourselves. And then when you do your generation, we just put together some simple graphics so that you can visualize you know, the original data set versus the synthetic data set. So as you all know, we are running the, the Quant University Summer School, which includes machine learning, another one on model risk management. So one of the themes in the machine learning course is synthetic data generation. And when we illustrate various concepts, we kind of use these kinds of applications to illustrate these concepts. In addition to that, uh, on the synthetic data generation end, uh, we actually are building like a whole library of different models. We call it the Q-Synthesize so that we can illustrate, compare, contrast different methodologies. And uh, we are trying out different applications based on the different research works uh, which are out there. So if anybody is interested in either collaborating or sharing their work, or also just have questions in general to try out what we've been doing, please reach out to us and we'll be able to uh, get back to you and see if there are any collaboration opportunities. Um, the last uh, couple of things I want to let you know, uh, just to wrap up the session. I'm just going to see if we can uh, go to the last few slides. So uh, as I mentioned, all the slides and the video will be accessible on QRod Academy. Next week, we have Tony Guaida. He is uh, a researcher at RAM Active Systems, but he is also uh, the author of the book, Machine Learning for Factor Investing. And we're kind of mixing different themes, you know, some aspects, uh, some uh, lectures more focused on machine learning, some focused on financial applications. And in this particular case, it's the application of machine learning for specifically factor investing. So it'll be an interesting uh, discussion. And Tony also has promised to share some of the code. So we'll see if we can get some of the R or the Python code and embed into the application so that you can, you can try it out. And again, thank you for your time and uh, looking forward to meeting you again next week, Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Thank you again. Thanks again, Julia. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.